happy Wednesday and thank you very much for joining another session of RM Smart Investing. We are um, going to uh, continue on the, the commodity classes that we had started actually over two and a half years ago. And I thought it might be a timely um, uh, subject to speak and uh, analyze investing in copper, especially when we talk about copper, we basically talking about Dr. Copper. And the reason for that name is that the copper is one of the major commodities who indicate the health of the global economy. So as the copper goes, as the, or the vice versa, the global economy goes, so goes the copper or vice versa. So that's what I think is important. Obviously with the question of the interest rates, inflation, and the recession that we keep hearing, not only in the United States, but all over the globe. Again, I thought it, it is a good idea to get a little more handle on understanding what may, makes uh, copper tick. And actually, what is copper? I know it might be a silly question, but what, what when we talk about copper, what are we talking about? So the copper is one of the oldest elements. It's been around for 10,000 years. It is malleable and ductile metallic element that is an excellent conductor of heat and electricity, as well as being corrosion resistance and antimicrobial. So right in that three sentences, you can see, or the three lines, you can see the value of the copper and why it still has existed to this day and is in demand. Copper occurs naturally in the Earth's crust in a variety of forms. It can be found in you know, sulfide deposits, in carbonate deposits, in silicate deposits, and as a pure native copper. Now, also, this is very interesting. Unlike other ones, copper also occurs naturally in humans, animals, and plants. Organic life forms have evolved in an environmental containing copper. As a nutrient and essential element, copper is vital to maintaining health. Life sustaining function depends on copper. As a matter of fact, sometimes you have like these uh, at night, you can see these infomercials. You cannot sleep. And of course, you turn the TV on and you, you keep thinking about the healing power of copper. So there are some connections with that. Copper is also one of the most recycled of all metals. It is our ability to recycle uh, metals over and over again that makes them a material choice. Uh, uh, recycled copper, we call them secondary copper, cannot be distinguished from the primary copper, which is originating from ores. Once pre-processed, so it's important to see again another advantage for copper. Recycling copper extends the efficiency of use of the metal results in energy savings and contributes to ensuring that we have a sustainable source of metal for the future generations. So before I go uh, further, I thought, well, let's start with some fun facts. And again, it hopefully gives you a little um, more understanding where what copper is. And um, one of the silly things, of course, we have the, the penny, which is supposed to be part, you know, made out of copper. Up until 1982, USA pennies were about 98% copper. Now they're all pure zinc with copper electroplating. So actually producing one penny costs more than, the production cost is more than that one penny. As far as the second fact is when uh, architectural structures built with copper, uh, with you know, copper corrode, they form a green uh, verdigris. So that's why you, know, you can see why, for instance, the Statue of Liberty appears green. The third fact about copper is it's a ductile metal, as we just said. So it can be stretched into wire format with very high thermal and electrical conductivity. Electrical uses of copper, including power transmission and generation, building wiring, telecommunication, and electro electrical and electronic products account for about three quarters of total copper use. And the fourth one is, as I mentioned, it's one of the oldest 
metals around 10,000 years. So it's been around for a long time and they've gone to the Bronze Age and uh, because of that. The fifth um, fun fact is copper plays well with the other metals. And we'll talk a little more about that and actually results in harder alloys than the original metal. So we have brass, for instance, which is a mixture of copper and zinc, while we also have bronze as a mixture of copper and tin. Um, copper is also present in every tissue of the body and helps our body utilize iron, keeps our thyroid gland functioning normally, maintains the health of our bones, and preserves the myelin sheet that protects our nerves. Another interesting fact is number seven, which says asparagus is an excellent source of copper. The last but not least, I thought this was interesting. The reason police officers in the USA are nicknamed cops or coppers, it dates back to when their uniforms had a copper button. So I thought with just a little fun facts, you can put everything together and see the depth of what copper is. So um, I go back to 2019, right before the pandemics, and to see, again, why we talk about Dr. Copper, why we say it's the health of the global economy, it is a diverse usage and very much economic or economy-related uses of copper. Uh, in 2019, about 43% of copper was used in building construction, 20% uh, in electrical and in electronics. Transportation equipment was 20%, consumer products 10%, machinery 7%. So there's a very diverse usage. Uh, they're also in the medical, you know, dental. So, and as you will see in, also we will talk about uh, alternative energy. So, Basically, the uses of copper are used in the first use, end use, the first use like in the foil and tubes and wires, rods, bars, um, the flat roll products such as plates, sheets, and, and strips. And then they also have the end use. So they are used in equipment and in industrial transport, infrastructure, building construction. So again, a wide variety of uses. Also, they are from the beginning to end, from, uh, from generating an electrical grids, when we talk about infrastructure, which are very old by the way in the United States, so they have to be replaced. Copper is needed virtually in all of those stages, from generation to transportation, to distribution, to consumption. So you see the necessities of uh, the copper and really not you know, substitute at this time. So here comes the big things. And now fast forward to 2022, and we will actually go to 2025, 2026. Electrical vehicles, as you know, there is obviously the big push, it's alternative energy. People are talking, everybody talks about lithium, but there's large amount of copper needed to build just one electrical vehicle. You see one conventional gas powered car, 18 to 49 pounds of copper are needed to build that one car, depending on the engine size. But in just one electric vehicle, a whopping 183 pounds of copper is needed to build one electrical en engine. That's like four to 10 times more copper. Now, because of the soaring demand for EVs, and also it comes back to the political, you know, uh, who's in power, you can think of Europe, for instance, this rising, this is gonna rise a lot more in the next decade. So that means there will be more demand for copper and that's gonna, the demand will explode. EVs are expected to increase 14 times by 2030 from the 1.8 million EVs in the road in 2010 to over 25 million EVs by 2030. And that's over 23 million new EVs in operation. Also, it, again, copper is critical in building electrical engines, solar panels, and wind turbines to power the green revolution. So this is a very timely time. Basically, think about what is happening in Europe. There's going to be more push for green energy, for alternative energy, and copper has always been a valuable commodity. But now, we think about renewable energy technology, we see the demand. And because of that, 
that gives you the indication that uh, you know where will be that turning point. What is the, you know as far as when you're ready to move in, and this is one of the reasons that they will be here to stay. Some nations that are abandoned in the red metal are increasing investment in copper mining because they know the need and exploration to record level to meet the high demand, while the largest producer is beset by the challenges. So the other thing is today it's 114,000 megawatt is generated by solar power in the US. It takes five and a half tons of copper to generate only one megawatt. And that's 627,000 tons of copper. And a single wind turbine contains up to 4.7 tons of copper. In the USA today, events, uh, in the US today, again, about 67,000 wind turbines are operating. That represents 315,000 tons of copper. So the International Energy Agency reports that the world added 290 gigawatts in renewable electricity in 2021. Again, just think about, now, this was 2021, and now you're talking about Europe. You're talking about, again, Ukraine and Russia situation. Now, that was about one and a half million tons of copper used to increase solar and wind electrical output last year alone, which was 2021. And according to IEA, 2021 Renewable Energy Report, global renewable electricity is expected to increase 60% from current level by 2026. And I would say even more, again, with the challenges that we've had in 2022. So now that I kind of opened the door, so hopefully you can understand copper a little better. And I also gave some of the uses for the copper. So what factors, it, it drives the copper price. It, and as always, any commodity, we talk about the supply and demand. So let's start with the demand factors. Again, I go back to that Dr. Copper. Obviously, again, with the, all the industrial related, economic related uh, demand for the copper, the global economy plays a big role. So as soon as you hear recessions, as we can hear slowdown in the economy, then you understand why the price of copper could go down. On the other hand, if there is a um, turnaround move in the in the copper, it could it will um, go up, and that's the time uh, it actually will, might give you the heads up that's saying that listen, the global economy is in the mend and it's going to grow. Besides that, China is the biggest user of copper. So the China's health is also very important. So their economy, as it grows, there's a demand. So according to numbers, 54% of the world consumption and usage is by China. So China is a huge. So any times that we've had, let's say the shutdowns because of the pandemics, well, you could see it absolutely has affected the price of copper. So once the China's economy grows and the things are open, for instance, then that's positive for, um, for copper. And we just talked about renewable energy as that's growing and the demand is there, that will affect the price of the copper. We turn around and we think about the supply factors. So I, not in a specific order, the, one of the things in the supplies, obviously, it comes from the mining. So because of the political reasons or whatever reasons they are, the miners, when they strike, there is less supply. So the prices go higher. We could also, with the miner strikes, you can talk about earthquakes. Some of the regions that the copper is produced, they are in an earthquake zone. So let's say earthquakes will affect the price, which is a natural uh, event that will, um, affect the price of the copper. The cost of production. As the cost goes up, obviously the prices will go up. The scrap availability, you know, there's a, there's a refined, there's some that um, been used and there's some that there haven't been and they can be scrapped. And as those are available and they're decreasing, actually the price will go up. The governmental programs, I mean, especially in Latin America right now, which are the largest producers. Now, if the government, let's say they come, they want to nationalize or they want to 
uh, enforce taxations on some of the foreign governments and affecting the, the trade policies, all of those actually affect the price of the copper. So the less the governmental interference, the, the higher the price will go. Um, the speculators, the hedge funds, uh, the, the traders who actually are, are dabbling, so the more activities from there, and we talk um, about commitment of the traders, what they are looking at, the more they're active, uh, most of the time because of those activities, the prices could go up. And then uh, last but not least is the supply level as uh, you know, the supply level decreases and it, it gets to a point of leveling off, then eventually that will uh, be a, a good sign for increasing. Give you a good example. Let's say in pandemic in 2020, for instance, we had an, an example of this that things really shut down. You know, there's nobody. The miners are not working, so obviously supply was down. But also remember, the main thing is the demand, and there was no demand, so the prices collapsed. So this thing I want to remember. One of the signs that you know if there is a turnaround in the price of copper, if it's really overextended, and I will say the linear regression channel, it's like outside the two standard deviation, is when the cost of production is actually higher than the price of copper. So if that cost, and in this case, the supplies are not needed, so they're gonna shut down the mining. Eventually the economy is gonna turn around. So when the things turn around, you don't have the production, and that's a good sign that to tell you when is a good price for the price of copper. So if it takes me $1.50 to produce, let's say ton of copper, and copper is at the dollar or a dollar 20, I'm going to shut down the mine. Why am I going to spend? So basically now you're reducing your supply. So eventually we get to that break even in the below that. So we are really, as far as evaluations, we are very undervalued. And those are the times such as we had in December of 2008, for instance, the price of copper a generational low, and that was a perfect time. So you want to watch for that. Since I spoke about that, let me just give you another hint before we go to the next factor, is generally the price of copper, when it's around $4 or more, we are in a growth stage. When we are less than that, especially closer to three, then we are in the recessionary or very slow demands. So basically we use that as a pricing. So if the trend is up and we're going toward $4 and we break the four, that means we're in expansion. So that's just a general rule. It's not uh, packed in the stone, but just to uh, give you a heads up. The other factors are uh, like any other commodity is the US dollar, especially you can feel it now. So as the dollar gets strong, commodities actually drop. As the dollar gets weaker, the price of commodities rise, and it works with, um, again, another factor with the US dollar. The second thing is, it's very interesting, is it a very big relationship between the, uh, the Western Texas Intermediate, uh, the WTIC, the crude oil price, and the price of copper. As you know, copper, it takes a lot of energy for the production and mining of it, so, and the refining it, so basically, once the price of oil rises, so does the price of copper. So this is, so obviously the cost is higher, so it will affect the, the, the margins, but then you have to increase the prices of the copper. So this is a very interesting correlation between copper and the crude oil. So with that in mind, I thought this is an interesting chart. As you can see, this goes back to 2000. And this is a relationship of, in blue, you see the copper and uh, then you can see the West Texas intermediate crude. So um, the other thing we talked about China. So again, the GDP year over year of China, the, the reduction in the GDP corresponds with the reduction and the demand for copper and basically the price of copper. Some of the regions around the world, I thought it would be interesting to see uh, in 1960s where the production came from 
and 9, 2020. As you can see, at that time, the biggest region, when you think about it, was North America. It was United States and Canada and Mexico. And Latin America was actually the third region after US, I mean, North America, Africa, it was Latin America. Fast forward to 2020, is 41% of the world production comes from Latin America, while Asia is 16% thanks to China, but also we have Central Asian countries like the Saxon, we have like also, uh, um, some other smaller countries. But uh, when you look at that, you see there's a huge difference and you see Africa has really come down. So that's as far as the production goes. As far as the consumption, this is as of 2019. So you see how big China is, and then we have Europe, Africa, America uh, is 12% and other Asians 19%. But as of uh, this year, 2022, it's about 54%. So, uh, or 2021, I'm sorry, 2021 was about 54%. So <laughs> keep that in mind. And talking about China, they've been doing this for many years. They're very smart. And they've been uh, doing the copper acquisition in all over the globe. Um, They've been doing uh, steel and iron acquisitions. So they go around and they are collecting. So in this situation, you see they've had a big presence in Africa and also the Asia Pacific. So this is just a food for thought. Again, the influence of China. The other thing I, I went back and it, I, we talked about the supply side of things and the demand. So we can see this is this chart is uh, in the middle of 20, uh, toward end of the 2020. And you could see again, we were in the lowest level in nearly 15 years as far as the uh, inventories. So we had plunged the inventory. So the question is now, if the recession or the, the demand would have stayed down, well, obviously there's no activities, but eventually, if you remember with the vaccination, Oh, uh, and you know, we had elections in the United States, things started moving, and obviously the demand came back, and we came back to equilibrium. So basically, we were really under, as you can see. So there was no more inventory. So that's the reason the price actually moved up in the past in a year and a half or so, we're up like 125%, which we'll discuss it a little more. And um, going back to 2006. We have the average change, the average everything else as far as the co copper production has been about three and a half percent. So year by year, when we are uh, looking at in the projection, we see, first of all, the productions where the, the projection is. So we've had um, obviously a little slowdown in the 2020, but we have started moving up and there will be a little slowdown, but then the, the, the production will go up. So this is as far as the copper production. We talked about one of the unique things about copper is um, being able to mix with other um, metals. And in this case is, is what we call them alloy. So copper can mix with tin and that's called bronze. So the bronze is using bells and medals and symbols, statues, guitar and piano, strings, screws. So the list goes on, you know, the bearings and it, um, we talk about bronze wool, the coins, electric contacts and connectors. So as you can see, marine architectural, the metals, as I mentioned, mirrors, oil rig components. So you see there's tremendous number of usages. And again, we have to use copper. So that's what is called bronze. Then if you mix the, the copper with, uh, with zinc, we come up with something called brass. And if the brass obviously has a, a lighter finish and, and it's like a golden colored corrosion resistance, but not towards salt water and used mainly for decorative purposes. So here we are, as you can see the ornaments, you see the hardware, uh, musical instruments. So uh, basically, um, they're really looking good in a sense, and that's why they have a high cost and they have the brittle with cold uh, work. So, but they are ductile and does not grow to any great extent. Um, 
so what are we just briefly mentioned about the top countries, but let's say as of um, now, what are the world's top copper producers? So number one by far is Chile in South America is 5.7 million tons in 2020. And right behind it is neighbor is Peru. And that's, you can see the difference. It's the second most is at 2.2 million. And Peru had, again, there was a question of uh, political interference with the copper minings or not. The same thing with Chile, actually. They had election passed uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, and there was that question, will there be interference? So, so far hasn't been. China being the largest consumer, but also they're the third largest producers. They produce uh, or actually mined 1.7 million uh, tons of copper in 2020. And then we come to Africa, Democratic Republic of Congo is 1.3 million. Then we are in United States, which is the number five and then 1.2 million. So very close. Um, number six is Australia. And then uh, we can just look at Russia, Zambia, Mexico, and Kazakhstan are the top 10. To make it a little simpler, you can see it again, how Chile is by far the biggest producer, but you also see this Canada, which is really very close to top 10, Indonesia, Poland, Brazil, Iran, uh, Mongolia, Panama, Spain, Myanmar, and Bulgaria, they also are producers of copper. Now, we, I just talked about Canada, so let's, there are, you will notice there are a few companies that they are listed in the United States that they have, you know, obviously Chile and Peru are the big ones, but also they're Canadian companies who are uh, copper producers. So the biggest one by far, the biggest mining uh, area is in British Columbia. So when you look at the Manitoba and Quebec, all of a sudden you see you know, British Columbia is almost 11 times the Manitoba, the double the Ontario. So how about the trade flows? And this is about copper ores. So the ore, just to start, you know, the raw, uh, the um, uh, copper, you see the biggest major exporters. It, it makes sense. We have Chile and Peru, but then you have Mexico and Australia and Mongolia. So the United States, Indonesia, Brazil, Kazakhstan, and Congo. The major importers, um, no surprise, it's China, Japan, Korea, Republic, Spain, Germany, Bulgaria, Mexico, India, Finland, and Russian Federation. So how about as of 2022, we wanted to compare the quarter one of 2021 output to 2022 uh, output. So uh, Cadelco, Freeport McMarran, and Glencore, these are the three top, there's a Chilean company there. And then we have BHP, Southern Copper, which is Peru. Uh, and then we have Zine Minings and KGHM and the first quantum, Rio Tinto. And uh, then we have Antofagasta. So not all of these, I mean, uh, when you think about all of these companies, they do other mining, that's some really coal, gold, silver. So it's not just copper, but they're the major producers. You can see the, the production on these companies. All right, so now that hopefully you are comfortable understanding the copper, you are comfortable uh, knowing the value of the copper, the uses of the copper, so you're excited, you say, well, how am I going to invest in copper? I'm ready to go. Let's go and invest in copper because you feel based on your fundamental analysis and based on what you will say, you look at the chart, you're ready to do that. So. One of the easiest ways, obviously, if you are trading futures, would be you can do the full contract, which is the symbol. You know, they have a root in futures, is the HG. So, and then we add the months of expiration. So, um, basically, it's HGZ22, like a December contract you want to use. Basically, that is uh, the full contract. And each one point, and this is very important. So let's say um, uh, copper is at 350, it goes to 450. One full point is $25,000. So that tells you sometimes when the moves are, that's our um, about turnaround, the infliction points, when you are in those like undervalued points, 
and I will share you the chart, you see how much the move can make you money. If you're on the right side, that is fantastic. So, and each, you know, they go to the tenth of a thousand of decimal point. So there's a, and it's tenth of a thousand. So each point consequently is like $5. So keep uh, that in mind. And then, HG is um, the big contract. Then you have QC, and that's called E meaning, which is a half a contract. And then obviously, thankfully, they are, um, we have the CME has come up with these micros, and I think they will help you tremendously to be in, the, um, in your positions much longer because they are one tenth of the value of what the full contract is. So, M actually, when you put M in front of any contracts, it becomes micro. So it's just a food for thought. If you want to dabble, I would start with micro. That's a big contracts when you're talking about the money. And you know, things like natural gas, silver, copper, you just want to be more careful. Now, let's say you don't want to do futures. So there are two major ETFs, um, but they're purely for copper, and they also are uh, liquid enough so you can. Uh, uh, ETFs are JJC and CPER. Now, if you like to invest in stocks, these are the five largest by market cap. Um, FCX is about 40 billion. Uh, Freeport McMahon and then Sovereign Copper is about 35 billion. Then you have the TRQ. Now, TRQ um, is um, it's actually it's, it's registered in Canada, so it's a, a Canadian company. But most of their mining comes from uh, Mongolia. So they, they're very active there. They have a contract with the government. They have HBM and IP. So these are the five top stocks that you, if you like, again, purely on copper. So of course we have BHP and Rio Tinte, but they're involved in different mining, um, other mining uh, uh, metals. Um, if you didn't have enough capital and but really interested in doing uh, more, get involved with copper. Um, you could have options on the futures. You could do spreads on options on the futures. You could use ETFs, uh, both JGC and CPR. They do have options on them. And also, you know, FCX and SCCO, they do have options on them. So uh, let's do a little journey back. Um, let's take a look at for the past 10 years, for instance, what copper has um, as far as their performance, what they have done. As you can see, 2021, they were up 25.7%, 26%, which was a big move toward after the vaccination, like the other ones, um, 2019, 3.36. And then they had a big loss in 2018, up big time in 2017, 2016, big time down 2015 and 14, down again, three years in a row. And then 2012, they were... Um, down about, uh, I mean, up about 4%. So you see they are not on the extremes uh, of each year. So there are some, um, for instance, if you um, look at like say palladium or sometimes we go to the extremes. So basically copper is more of a, in a second and third quarter. Um, if you wanna look at all the commodities that was more on the industrial and precious metals, this is all the commodities. Again, nothing has changed. It's the exact same thing. But again, you can see compared to other commodities where they, they stand. So I want to take a look at the picture of today. And again, last year they were up 25, 26%. So year to date, as of September 28, um, they are down 24.2%. And you see the the big relationships that you see what is happening is Russell is down 23%, NASDAQ is down 29%, DAX is down 22%, Euro stocks are down 21%, SP is down 21.5%. So, and the 30 year bonds are 21. So, it's a very much financial related. So, take that into consideration. So, uh, coming to the end, I just want to share with you something, believe it or not, this the, two years ago, we had a mini class on copper. And this is a chart from our presentation exactly two years ago, almost day, October 2nd. And what we did, we did go over copper for about 
10 minutes or so. And we suggest that this might be an interesting time to look at copper based on the technicals. Now, uh, obviously this was before the vaccination, it's before the election. So you, you see we have come down, but we had hit that the second standard deviation on a daily basis on the copper. So basically the, the copper was at $2.98. On top of that, the copper had come down and uh, basically what had happened was hitting this 100 day moving average. And that's again, October 2nd, that was uh, the price. So I thought, well, let's come fast forward and say, okay, what happened after that? So this is a, a weekly chart. And as you notice what we did, um, we hit that 18 weeks moving average, October 2nd, and we stayed above that 18 week moving average. And we went, Big time outside the bone joint, you were close to five. So you went up about $2, which translates about $50,000. And then after that, we really um, basically in the, the chop zone and the bone joint then started narrowing. But um, this is what happened um, again after um, that uh, LRC. So uh, look at the linear regression channel, as you know, it's one of my favorites. I want to look at it. Where are we today on a, on a weekly chart? And this is a 100-week um, uh, LRC, and this is a 30-week LRC. So at this moment, uh, and again, these are December contracts, so we are, it's almost like a double bottom. We just been, we hit the second stand deviation in um, July, and then we hit it again now. And uh, basically, the question is, are we going to follow the 30 week and with this actual, the average, the mean regression channel and just continue going down? Or will we have this bounce? So the question is about interest rates, economy, the dollar. And uh, it, that's something we want to look at opening of the economy in China. When some Chinese are thinking of opening Macau in November, uh, getting the activities going. And those are things that might bode well for, um, for instance, copper. Now, one thing you can see, we've been on the positive side and back and forth on that mean of the 100 week. And we've been back and forth within the second standard deviation and uh, the mean. And once we broke it, it didn't take that long to go to that second standard deviation. So uh, keep that in mind, very much correlated right, when you think about the crude oil, but also stock market as well, economy sensitive. The last but not least, I wanted to look at um, the, the chart of a monthly linear regression channel. You, you could see how we came very close to the, the highs of the 2010 and we got rejected. And now um, the trend is still up on LRC and we have, we've been touching the, um, the lower, the second standard deviation. So the question is, um, this is the September, it hasn't ended yet. So we wanna take a look at over the weekend perhaps um, to see where we close. But uh, this is where we stand as far as the monthly linear regression channel, we have a double top but also multiple resistances in this area. So um, with that in mind, I hope that was helpful. You feel hopefully more confident in moving on and maybe explore some more with, uh, with copper. And as I said, it is Dr. Copper, very much economic uh, related. So um, again, that will tell you what is the outlook um, would the interest rates really drive us to recession and the higher dollar would drive us to recession. So basically those are the things we have to ask yourself again. It's a very much global issue rather than let's say just the United States issue. So with that in mind, what I'm gonna do, I will stop the recording and then I open up for um, any questions or comments that you have.